What's going on, everybody? Welcome. What's going on, everybody? Sorry. Welcome to the uh, latest episode of Cash Flow Dad Life. I apologize, guys, for missing last Thursday. Um, I had full intentions to release a podcast, but I was actually in Tampa looking at a billion-dollar multifamily investment operation. Um, so it was really cool stuff, which I'll share with you guys later. But today, I'm stoked to have on our show an expert in the hotel industry. I ended up suckering him to come on here and share his expertise with us and his wisdom. Uh, his name is Josh McCallan. Josh, you there? Can you hear me all right? Absolutely. Great to be here, Ryan. And, and for those of you that are watching, Josh has got a sweet green screen in the background with, the, <laughs> with, the, with his perfect, perfect setup. Um, so uh, Josh is actually an expert in the hotel industry. And what our episode is going to be about today is how you can get started in playing Monopoly in real life, how you can get started in investing uh, in hotels, like in Monopoly, you know, the goal of the game is you first go around the board and you buy a bunch of houses, right? And then once you get past a certain level, you get started with investing in hotels. And if somebody lands on your spot, then you're bringing in a lot more cash flow. And so we're seeing a lot of different trends in the industry. What we're going to talk about today is the different ways that you can get started investing, uh, the different strategies, the different plays that are out there and Josh is going to give us the wisdom. But first, Josh, can you give us a little bit of your background? Like, what's your story? How did you even get started investing in hotels in the first place? Well, I'll tell you, it's absolutely great to be with you, Ryan. So the answer to that is, there's a short form and a long form. But the short form is this. I first was a house developer. Very, very high-end, beachfront. As a matter of fact, we, uh, I was the project manager, guy on the field building five, $6 million houses during the boom days, 06, 07. And then right as the 08 crash came, that business model stopped. Um, so then years later, we had a condo building, a hotel that we thought would be a condo building. And by 2012, we were comfortable enough to try to get into the hotel industry by fixing that up. So basically the story is I'm like you just said, I'm just like most of your listeners I started in the house world. Of course, it was the highest end of fancy houses, but fancy house speculation. So we would flip a $5 million beach house. Of course, I wasn't the capital at that time. I was just the doer. And then we would, uh, we would make incredible returns, but boy, we were living at the tip of that spear, right? So right as the recession changed uh, and came and the economy changed, we stopped that business model. And then the, the hotel world, was a natural, happy accident. We had one of those buildings we liked to tear down. Um, and the answer was in 2012, we sat down and said, what should we do with it? It's a dump. And from that genesis of a conversation in 2012, grew out a phenomenal hotel company that was became nationally ranked. That's awesome. That's awesome. And you said you're like most of my listeners, but I think my average listener maybe has one or two kids. And oh. uh, I think the most kids <laughs> of a dad that we've ever had on this show was six. So you've banged out nine kids, right? It's <laughs> Brian, absolutely. As a matter of fact, you know what? The kids love listening to you, buddy. Just so you know, FYI. So uh, they always I gotta watch my language sometimes. <laughs> don't worry, because we, we always say we raise them like baby boomers, so they're a little tougher. But uh, no, we have nine kids, Ryan. Nine. Well, we're, trying to, we're trying to stay ahead of you in one area of life, okay, buddy? Well, you are way, way ahead of me in that, man. And uh, I don't know if anyone's ever told you this, but I get the joke all the time that you guys should probably get a TV for your bedroom. So. It's a good <laughs> joke, man. I have, it's a good joke. I, How I, many times have you heard that one? <laughs> a, a lot. <laughs> that's perfect awesome man all right well let's let's continue with the story what um so you started you know with with high-end flips kind of speculation right. and then you got more into you know the hotels can you tell us a little bit about your last project that you did yeah great question so i just recently was able to um exit a wonderful company on great terms, was able to uh, start this new company because we had so many new opportunities. But, but during my six-year tenureship, uh, we had the privilege of serving not only as a partner, but as the president of a very sizable company. And during that property, during that time, we ended up growing from one hotel into three in five years. Um, and we really established a culture and a management company that allowed us to look for, you know, we were looking 
to the future. As a matter of fact, that's where my new company came from, uh, was from all the, the wonderful, you know, effort that we put into the first company. We now have the opportunity to grow it. I, I would say probably a property a year, if not more. Um, and I always say it's like we built a franchise prototype the whole time. The whole time we did our first hotel, I kept saying, Ray Crockett, Ray Crock the heck out of this hotel. Meaning if we do a great job marketing something, let's repeat that. If it's seasonal, let's repeat it quarterly. Let's repeat it. So we, we built a standard operating procedure for aggressive marketing, strategic partnerships, amenities, all kinds of things at hotels. Uh, we did it so we could repeat it. Um, so it's been a hell of a ride. Yeah, that's awesome. And it's, and it's funny you mentioned Ray. Is it Ray Crocker or Crockett? I always get it mixed up. Which one is it? Okay. He's like a big part of our culture. So he is right. Mr. Ray Croc. Mr. However, Ray Croc. But I think it's great when you put the er in there. I listened to another podcast and you kept calling him Ray Crocker. Yeah, I did. I was, yeah, thinking, I, did. <laughs> I was thinking Ryan. Ryan's going to fall in love with this guy someday and he'll never get that wrong. Yeah. Oh man, I, I mess up my my name so much. When whenever uh, whenever I'm talking to my own children or if I'm coaching football and I get a kid's name wrong, I'm like, you know who you are. Don't. Oh, you know, I like that. You don't need me to tell you who you are. <laughs> and no. Ray and Ray Crocker doesn't need me to tell him that it's <laughs> Croc. Whatever. You just nailed it though, buddy. And I hope it comes up. And feel free to get to it whenever you want. But you told on the you've told in the past that Ray Croc was really in the real estate business. This is the guy that created right. the fastest. Mm -hmm. cheeseburger for under a dollar, right? Even now it's just a dollar still, I guess. Um, mm -hmm. So that guy really wasn't in the cheeseburger business. He was really in the, the real estate, estate business. Right. And what's really interesting though, is his real estate business wouldn't have worked if his cheeseburgers didn't work. That's right. So they're kind of like symbiotic. And that's how I look at hotels. You know, yeah. what we, what we said was r buying hotels is great, but really making money is in the operations. So we Absolutely. focus on the operations so that we can really return a ton of money to the asset owners. Right. So, so tell us a little bit. So for the lay person who's never invested in hotels, there's essentially three ways of doing it. Um, can you kind of cover those three different ways that you can get started investing in hotels and sure. maybe, maybe the pros and cons of each of them? Yeah. I mean, the simplest way I came to understand this was, again, we grew grassroots so we ended up studying it by going to conferences and meeting everybody. But here's what I, I distilled it down to. Anybody with a significant amount of capital can go and petition Marriott or Wyndham to acquire uh, a license to have a Marriott or a Wyndham in their market. And they can buy that piece of real estate like Ray Kroc is talking about and then have a hotel built by the development company the design company of Marriott. So that's way number one. You just write a gigantic check. Mm -hmm. Now that goes to cash flow passive, passive dad life or cash flow dad life, my favorite. Right. That would work. So just write a $10 million check and go ahead and buy one. Mm -hmm. The license and then have them manage it. And that's a good program. If it works economically, I might even do that someday. But that's one way to do it. That's what I would call a stable cash flow model. Mm -hmm. uh, the other way to do it is uh, we could go buy any independent hotel, cost less money usually, um, and then it's on us to find a manager. And what, what, what that means is you usually hire one of these third-party management companies, mm -hmm. and um, they do okay. Um, their, their reputation of most third-party management companies is they'll keep the lights on and they'll do their job. You're Didn't not really you looking at it. Didn't, didn't you have one situation where you guys actually started off with the model of let's make this a passive income play and let's do like a third party management company? How did that work out? We did. The same properties that I was talking about a moment ago started with the, that strategy, which is the normal strategy. Buy a hotel because you love the location and call in a specialist, a third party manager. Let them have a fee and they will run the property. Actually, what happens the day after you sign the management contract is you're technically not allowed to ever speak to the staff and uh, in authority. You're not allowed to direct them because that's what you signed. You signed an agreement that you won't do that uh, and that they will do that and they'll take responsibility. Uh, what we ended up finding is that the, that group, probably that kind of group, which there's at least hundreds of them, 
um, will work in a stable, like side of the road, side of the highway hotel. That would be a great model. But when you're trying to uh, build wealth, I'm not sure that's the best model. Mm -hmm. And then the third model is what a lot of people trap themselves into is they buy a hotel. Maybe it's a small motel even, and they become their own manager. They might even get a little place nearby and live there and run it. And that's the opposite of passive cash, passive uh, income. Yeah. So actually I said there's three ways. Well, there's actually four ways. The other way is through a syndicated model, like basically people who are private, um, you know, they're, they're buying these private places and fixing them up and, and, uh, yep. and, and operating it themselves. Right. Touch on and, that uh, Ryan, I announce it here first. Okay. Cashflow <laughs> dad life. This is a big announcement. We, we believe that that is what the market needs. What you just described is pretty rare. And this means good people can get into the hotel world and all the benefits of the good, strong cash flow and even growth through syndication or through partnering with an operator. Um, you and I talk about it all the time. That's what multifamily has become, right? Most, mm -hmm. most people you interview can buy an apartment building by just recruiting 10 investors, correct? Mm -hmm. And that's a strong opportunity because basically you're, you're, you're giving the money to a, a lead sponsor and, and they're going to run the project, but you get a really nice piece of cash flow. So yeah. we think we're one of the first doing this for the hotel world. That's, that's, that's great. And, and, and that's what you do with apartments when you get started because, you know, you want to try to use, like a lot of people when they're getting started with real estate, they, they want to do it because of the passive income it generates. But what they end up finding out is that they've got another job. So you sacrifice some of the returns. Like there's real estate out there that you can get, you know, 120% returns on your money and you could flip houses and do all this stuff. But you, you have another job, you know, and, you, and you're not creating long-term passive income. And then there's people out there, they're like, I don't want to you know, send out mailers. I don't want to do marketing for motivated sellers. And for those people, the syndicated model is a great model because you can basically invest in somebody else's operation. <laughs> That's all right. I do it all the time. Um, so the syndicated model is a great model because you can basically invest in somebody else's operation. And uh, with that operation, um, you're getting that passive income. It's 100% passive. In fact, I think with SEC laws, it has to be passive. You cannot <laughs> be involved in it. Is that correct? It is. And, you know, um, Ryan, you, you explained it perfectly. It, it is a way for people to own, whether it be a hotel or an apartment. If you can partner with somebody that knows what they're doing and runs a property real well or buys them real well, um, you get all those benefits of being the actual primary owner. Remember, you probably have mentioned it in the past, but there's that other big advantage of tax advantages of real estate, mm -hmm. even when you're in a syndication. And I think right. that was a revolution for me, revolutionary moment for my wife and I. So as I uh, launched our own uh, company with this great team of pros, what we did is Melanie and I, my lovely wife, 21 years, uh, we actually flew to Dallas to learn how to do legal uh, partnerships in syndication. So um, we studied yeah. the benefits and why normal uh, investors do this. As a matter of fact, what surprised us was the hardworking professionals like the lawyers, the dentists, mm -hmm. um, you and I, we may want to jump into a different type of investment and we can do that through these little syndications. Yeah. And, and real quick for my listeners that uh, aren't exactly sure what a syndication is. A syndication is basically where you pull investors together to invest in a project. So that's, that's what a syndication is. It's just any investment opportunity where there's a number of investors uh, that is, that is uh, pooling their money together to, to, um, to, to purchase the property. And, and that way you can start with, say you've got 25,000 or a hundred thousand, but you can, participate with the big dogs in these 5 million, 10 million, 20 million, $50 million deals. Um, so it is a really cool concept that you can get involved in, in real estate. We'll talk more at the end um, on some creative ways that you might not have thought about that you could participate in a, in a, um, in a syndication as far you might say, I don't have, you know, a hundred grand in my bank account sitting around. So we'll talk about at the end, how you can still participate in things like that. Um, 
that'll be the little cherry on the top of the end for you guys. Um, but let's talk more about the different kind of plays with hotels. Like if you were to buy real estate and flip real estate, you want to go after something that needs a little work that you can add value to. You want a house, say it's a $150,000 house. You want a $150,000 house that needs maybe 20 grand of work that you can get for 90 grand. Um, so by adding value to that house, you can appreciate it. You could flip it or you could rent it out for a higher dollar. It's same is true with apartments. It seems like the real sweet spot with apartments is not the, there's like class A, B, C's, um, and D's, you know, in the apartment world, like, you know, different classes of apartments that you can purchase. Well, you don't want to get the class A's cause you can't add any value to it. So you're getting them at the top of the market value and you can't raise rents any because the, the rents are already as high as they can be. You want to get the class C apartment where you can raise rents by making improvements to the amenities and paint or adding AC units or washer dryers, you know, whatever it is that you can add value. And um, I believe that the hotel industry is very similar, but there's different ranking systems. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, no, you're right. Um, the, way I under, the way I explain it is <coughs> most of us are familiar probably with a three-star and this is where a three-star hotel just means that it has a restaurant. So anytime you've ever been to any Marriott, that would have been at least a three-star hotel. And that, that's a challenging hotel to run, just so you know, uh, because the restaurant in particular uh, adds numerous challenges. Then, then there's um, below that, there's a two-star, and this is where you have a great room or not so great room, depending, but no food and beverage, limited services. And then, of course, uh, then, of course, there's even higher. There's a four-star that goes above what you would think of at a Marriott. This is where usually it's like a resort, and it has extra amenities, maybe a spa, maybe um, killer pools, maybe it's on a beach. And all of those amenities are managed by the hotel. And then there's a five-star, which is rarefied air. It's the Four Seasons and the Ritz-Carlton. And uh, th those are the funny ones. Those don't actually make much money. But boy, they have a halo effect of value for, for developers. So they're done for other reasons. And really the sweet spot for me and us, our team has found is at the three and a half star to four star. This is where it has amenities that you can sell uh, and make money. So for us, the easiest one to think of is weddings. Mm -hmm. You know, if you're going to have a restaurant, because that's a challenging thing, you might as well make sure you have a gorgeous venue for weddings where there's a good bit of profit. Awesome. Awesome. So the sweet spot, take notes uh, of that guys. The sweet spot is the three and a half stars because you can come in and add the value and the kind of value that you can add is things like weddings and yeah. other amenities like that. Awesome. All right. So let's cover the last cherry on top, which is, so say you don't have a hundred grand in your bank account to get started. What is the best way that people um, that they might not know about or might not be aware of this opportunity. What's the best way for them to um, find funds to invest in projects like this? Well, you know, the, 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 the way most of our investors are finding funds is through their self-directed IRA. And uh, as, as I've come into uh, uh, become aware of this is so much of America's wealth is tied up in the stock market through their IRAs. Only 4% of these IRAs gets used other ways, but you can actually invest in cool private projects like this uh, with your IRA. So it allows us normal people to get involved. So without getting taxed, um, you can get a company like Equity Trust Fund um, and you could basically pull the money out of the IRA and into another investment without having, you know, the, the tax impl uh, implications as if you were just take money out of your IRA and they consider that income. Um, so it's actually a tremendous way to, uh, to invest in these things. So using a 401k is a great way to get started. And when you do it that way and you invest either in like your Marriott model uh, or with a syndication, that's where it becomes passive. Now, uh, just to rewind a little bit, because I think we skipped this when we were talking about the different ways that you can get involved in hotels. You've gotten involved in, you know, almost all of those ways. Can you kind of touch on, you know, what was the, the major learning experience, the aha movement, uh, moment? Where, uh, where you discovered that that one way wasn't passive. We, uh, 
Uh, this is a, a story that really, it's hard to believe. So I'm going to give you a visual. So we are just finishing rehabbing our first property. And boy, it's beautiful. It's actually in a marketplace that everybody's falling in love with it. We really hit the mark on the style and everything's cool. Bought all the breast sheets, bought everything great and new. Then we installed one of those third party managers who came so highly recommended. Matter of fact, they were certified by all the brands that they could even manage branded hotels, which I thought was a good litmus test. And one day I'm walking down the hall doing my punch list as the developer, checking some rooms, and we had given it, the hotel over to the operators about a month earlier. And this one nice lady named Mary is scurrying down the hall, clutching four sets of sheets. And I said, Mary, Mary, what's, what's wrong? And she says, well, uh, yeah, I'm sorry. I just have to go get the sheets early because if I don't, I won't have sheets and I got to get home today on time. I said, Mary, I don't even know what you're talking about. We have so many extra sheets per room. It's unbelievable what you're talking about. So she said, go check it out. So I walk into the laundry room, which was all fit out with brand new equipment, shelves and shelves, uh, originally full of, of sheets and they were all empty. And I said to the, the team that was cleaning, I said, this again, I'm not the manager yet. We're just the developers passively. We thought we were just building out a hotel and giving it to operators. And uh, this one gentleman, kind gentleman, Carlos, he brings me over to the closet down the hall, opens the door, and I'm talking like a, a closet that was 12 feet deep, eight feet wide, eight feet tall. The door could only open 45 degrees, and inside there was stacks of black trash bags with masking tape on every bag saying what dirty sheets were in there. Pillowcases, kings, twin, you know, uh, queens. And I asked what the heck he was talking about. What had happened was our management company couldn't keep up with the growth. We had opened right in the time for a busy, busy month. We were sold out every day and their whole process broke. So their process broke so badly that they weren't even getting all the sheets done. And, uh, it was really a mission critical moment. So I, uh, I kind of stepped in and uh, I was transparent, went down and talked to the managers and I said, hey, listen, we got to get these sheets clean. You guys can't keep up. Uh, we're going to help. So we took off our nice button shirt, went down to our, our tank top tee uh, and we backed up our little Honda Pilot, very humble little SUV and drove to the laundromat. <laughs> and we, we washed uh, clothes, well, actually sheets for three three days myself, and then I managed another guy for four more days until we got everything caught up to par. And uh, there was a picture of me, okay, Ryan, you'll see this someday, I'll have to show it to you, of me taking a selfie where every single machine in this gigantic laundromat is us. Yeah. I had been bringing like hundreds and hundreds of dollars of quarters down, and that helped us get over the hump. We got all the sheets back in the building, and the rooms now were clean because I thought, there's no way we want anybody in our building without super cleanliness. And that was the day I realized we were going to become hotel managers. And that's where you kind of uh, fell into your niche. I mean, you know, we, we, we talk a lot about um, creating passive income investments, but the whole reason to create passive income investments is so that you could do what you would do if money didn't matter, do what you love. You actually love managing hotels. I do. You know what, Ryan, this is why I feel like my wife tells me it's our calling in life. And we're, you know, Melanie, and I've never worked together. And um, when I had this opportunity to start doing this for Viva May, our company, uh, she said, this is now our calling. But I'll tell you, I'll tell you why real quick. Uh, recently, we had 500 employees and managing staff and training and all of that became a passion for me because I started you know, look, you and I are philosophical guys too, right? We're kind of heartfelt. And when I, when we started running hotels, uh, you know, I know you were joking earlier. We, we actually got this hotel to number seven in the country, um, picked up in the Wall Street Journal, USA Today. And we did that based on the fact that we put a culture in place. And that culture is just what's heart, what's, what's important to me. We just treat people with, with respect. And we, as a matter of fact, we always say to, to, to new applicants. We, we say, we want you to join our team, but you must possess these three characteristics or else you're not going to like it here. Because all we do is, is take 
you know, simple tasks and do them with love, you know? So hospitality is like the ultimate form of service. So I say to people, you might be the best front desk manager that I've ever seen on a resume, but can I share with you the three things it's going to take to succeed with us? And now you'll understand why I care about it. I say, number one, do you have a passion for people? Does it pop out of your pores? Do you, do you want to run to people when you see them? Two, does your, do you have a heart for humility? And what, became so clear to me when we worked in hotels and built these hotels out is every single thing we do in a hotel is super humble. We clean toilets, make beds, feed cheeseburgers to people. And you must want to seek humility. It, it takes a special kind of person to, to succeed with us. And then the third thing we always say, do you believe that you could be a force for good? And, and by treating guests with dignity and respect, can you, can, do you recognize how much good you're bringing into the world? And we say some people call it a ministry. So those are the three things. One, do you have a passion for people? Two, do you have a heart for humility? And three, do you, do you want to live for others? And if you have those three characteristics, you, you will love working with our team. And the good news is if you don't have those, you hate us. So we always try to encourage you not to join the team because we are, yeah, you know, we've died on that hill, man. We, we, so we, we spent the last six years. You should see the quantity of books we've read and the quantity of thinking we've put into this. We said, this is the way we would want to be treated. And so we built a whole standard operating procedure from the way we hire to the way we release uh, to the way we treat a guest. And so that process has become my life's work. Um, so for me that it is a job, but boy, it feels like a lot more than that. That's, that's so awesome. And, and it's so interesting that you mentioned culture and it's, uh, it's interesting to me right now, because as I said, in the beginning of the podcast, I just got finished visiting this billion dollar asset owning apartment company. And if you look at apartments, it's like, it's not sexy. It's not attractive. It's just apartments, you know, but what they did, the owners, from the ground up created this culture. And that's why they were able to grow so rapidly because they had the right culture in place. It wasn't just about the IRR and putting the numbers together and the ROI and all this other business talk. In fact, they could talk circles around you. They're all like, you know, Harvard grads, but it was this culture that they were able to create with a very mission centered purpose that permeated throughout everything they did. So it's, it's, uh, it's, it's timely for me to hear you say that, that, you know, one of the passions that you have is creating this culture. And, and ultimately, I think that's why you've been able to thrive in that industry. Yeah, it's a people industry. And you're right about the culture. By the way, culture doesn't happen by a speech. Uh, like you, you were saying, that other group, um, similar to us, I believe they meet every week. Uh, we do it. I always say, here's our meeting. We call it the why we do what we do. Uh, everybody can be really good at checking somebody in or cleaning dishes or cleaning toilets. But if they, uh, if we're not speaking in lockstep and if we're not there to serve the guests, the guests will never feel that extra level of support and love that we created. As a matter of fact, we used to call it a place of peace. Uh, and the only way we were able, able to get there was meeting every week and going over first principles. We called it the why we do what we do. And, um, <clears throat> That exercise is really rewarding, uh, really rewarding. And it, it does really begin, hey, I have one fun little thing that, that crossed my desk about three years ago, and this is why the culture is so important. The word hospitality, you'll never hear me say I'm in the hotel business. None of our team, uh, I encourage them not to say we're in the hotel business because hotel, um, it means a building. But hospitality means what we're delivering. And right. so for hospitality, once you, guys, once you get that, that part of the business right, the revenues for us almost doubled uh, within two years. And our, our profit, uh, we actually, this is true, we actually experienced a 10x growth from six years ago till today. That's why we were in Inc. 500. And the, the growth of our company was astronomical uh, by any standards, and it was really built on the culture. But the culture every week... Uh, Every week asked why we do what we do. And we, we would go over the, the, the core mission and the focus on people. That's awesome. That's incredible. And it's uh, it, anything that is mission driven and purpose driven is, is, 
uh, going to succeed one way or another, you know, yeah. uh, e- even, even if it's not monetarily at first, <laughs> you know, the, the culture and the purpose is, is really what drives things forward. Um, let's take it back down from 500 feet because we're, we're speaking from 500 feet up. Uh, let's take it back down and talk more specifically about strategy. We kind of touched on it earlier in the podcast, you know, different ways that you do things like with, you know, single families, you fix and flip, you buy it under value with apartments, you buy it under value. Uh, it's actually called the Burr method. Uh, if you can go uh, into a little bit what the Burr method is and how that relates and translates into hotel industry. Yes. So I learned that terminology from that other good website and podcast, uh, Bigger Pockets, but Brandon Turner explains it well. And so what he means by it, and I, it's funny because this is obviously what you, you do, I do. We buy, this is the B, we rehab, we reposition, we refinance, and then we get ready to repeat that process. And in the hotel business, um, this has been our focus um, over the last seven, six, seven years, is when we bought it, we bought it right. Uh, We're trying to buy below market, of course, as a matter of fact, the current project I was working on, and I'm still about to, uh, to acquire, we're buying at 27% of replacement value. Really great purchase price. But why? Because we need to rehab it when we get it, and we need to reposition it for its greater value. And the good news is we already uh, have it modeled out. We'll refinance it within five years. So we'll be ready to repeat. The cash will be back in the capital accounts. So, yeah, that is uh, – People always talk about it in multifamily, and what we're focused on at Viva May is is bringing that same tenacity of repeating the Burr method in the hotel world, and for us, the hospitality world. Yeah, and one of one of the actual cool things about a project like this, similar to the short term rentals, is you know, w- with my fish camp, I can stay at my fish camp when it's not being used and go fishing with my kids. Uh, it's it's got to be something similar to the hotel industry, right? You can stay at your. Uh, <laughs> It is. It is. It's funny. You know, you, you, for us, we use it as a, it's our everyday job, but even in your everyday job, you would be shocked how happy, um, how happy it makes people to bring them into a beautiful resort or hotel. So the same is true for investors. And uh, one of the promises I've, I've always thought was important is you got to make sure the investors enjoy their asset. So I think this is an unfair advantage we have over multifamily developers that, that are similar to me. Uh, here you get to enjoy it, visit, visit your resort, be proud of it. You get to put your name as a partner on, usually I like to focus on distressed resorts that, that have massive upside potential. So when we get them fixed up, I mean, you have an iconic property. As it, really, that's what our properties are. The ones I'm buying, typically the celebrities of your town usually go there. For the one I'm buying right now, uh, a lot of the NFL football players love this place. So you get this really nice halo effect when you buy into a resort. Yeah, that's awesome. Well, this has been such an awesome, uh, awesome podcast. We've learned a lot. If you've never even thought about or were always curious how you get into hotels, uh, we discussed that in today's podcast. Some of the things that I'm taking away are, um, are the different kinds of plays you have with the hotel, whether it's through Marriott or through <laughs> fixing up and trying to run one yourself or through a syndicate. Um, you know, there, it sounds like the syndicate is a really great play. Um, and, then, uh, and then we talked about the different, you know, so-called classes of hotels and where that sweet spot is. And Josh shared with us that the three and a half star is a really great sweet spot with the value add being weddings and such. Um, and, uh, and we talked about how you could tap into your 401k to even invest in these things. And uh, we, we discussed the Burr method as well. Um, and also, not to, not to uh, forget about this, we talked about creating a great culture and how that helps businesses thrive. Um, so with all that being said, what's next for you? Are you currently working on something? Hey, we are. We, um, th- this one is going to really knock people's socks off. We're, we're about to purchase... Uh, the third oldest winery in America from 1864. And you might say, well, I thought you were in hospitality. This place has had, I always say, 155 years of vineyard hospitality. It's, it's called Renault and it has hotel and golf course and it has this really special wine. As a matter of fact, it has the right to sell champagne. 
And you never hear that in America because it's. It Why is that substantial? You know what? Um, if you're going to sell something in America, it has to be usually sparkling wine. But right. this property has, uh, remember, it was founded when Abraham Lincoln was, was president. And the family came from Champagne, France and used all the authentic methods of rack and riddling of bottles to this day. So it's just always had the rights to continue using the name Champagne, even after everybody else lost that privilege. By the way, JFK and his dad used to drink here. And uh, as a matter of fact, JFK had his Champagne. His, his inauguration was all Renault Champagne. So you'll see that folklore all around the property. It's very exciting. So, so this is what you're focusing on now. It's got, uh, I believe it's got a golf course on there. It's got, uh, and so your main goal is to take this, is, is, is it, uh, does, it the, does, it, does it follow the McAllen method and, and it's got 3.5 stars right now? What would you classify? Great it? question. It does because it has all those amenities. It may even trip into the four stars. And uh, that, that may be a choice we make where you add a little extra service. But no, this has, it has what? It has so many revenue streams. That's why we're excited about it. Because each time you increase the revenue streams, you dramatically change the value for investors. That's right. And that's why we get excited about this one. That's awesome. Now, how do the banks see those? Like when you're buying multifamily, um, and you got a certain cap rate. Uh, yes. Once you're able to go in there and improve the property and you, you can raise the rents, then you just take those rents and divide it by the cap rate and there's your value. You refinance it and pay the investors back. Is it the same thing with hotels? It, it is. And what I always say, because I've also uh, invested in syndicates and multifamily, and I think that's a wonderful part of a portfolio. So it's got the similarities to that where you're, you're trying to improve the rent per room, like a hotel room. But then at a hotel like ours, we also can sell weddings and I can increase the wedding sales each year by a pretty significant factor. Whereas you probably can't increase the rents of an apartment every year. There's probably a ceiling in, in what we build. We've actually been able to blow past the ceilings and that's why I, I, I find them very attractive. And that's what our investors tell me is why they're joining us. Are there, are there cap rates that are indigenous yeah. to hotels or do they just follow the cap rates of the multifamilies in the area? No, it's, uh, it's different than the multifamilies. Uh, it's at, right now, I think you'd do well if you could find a seven and a half cap. Mm -hmm. um, but they, they're not as compressed as what's going on in multifamily, but the offsetting opportunity there is there's so much extra revenue that you can generate for the investor. Yeah. So the formula, guys, for everybody who's listening, if you're trying to value a multifamily or a hotel, you basically take the NOI, that's the net operating income, and you divide it by the cap rate. So what is, uh, what is, what is if you're taking, you said 7.5%? Yes, 7.5. Okay. And it, 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 goes, it goes up to eight even. And um, so with those, those are pretty stable. That's what it's been for a while. I've even seen them as low as the six is. But when we pro forma, we, we go conservative with 7.5. Okay. So th for those of you who are listening, um, say you were able to increase the revenue on a hotel for 100 th by $100,000. I'm sorry, the net operating income. If you were able to increase that by $100,000 a year, you divide that by the 7.5% cap rate. So if you're on your calculator, it's 100,000 divided by 0.075 which means that you've increased the value of that hotel by 1.3 million just by increasing the net operating income by a hundred thousand. So uh, for those of you that are curious about how those are evaluated, you just take that, uh, that um, net operating income and divide it by the cap rate and that gets you your valuation of the property. So that's great. So for you in that area, actually, that's actually. And, and I'm sorry, I couldn't hear you. It, it cut out just. For yeah, and a it gives you a clue as to why, when you start selling. No, but how about now? Yeah, I can hear no? you now. Hey, Rob. You're right, and and your cap rate study, what you you just explained very well, as you can see why dropping an extra hundred thousand dollars, whether it be from extra room rates, which we do, or extra weddings, uh, produces massive wealth. Okay. Awesome. Awesome. See, I love, I love getting into the uh, 500 feet up and I, get, I love getting into the math of everything too. So it's 
Really awesome. Hopefully you guys have gotten a ton of value out of this. Uh, Josh is just a wealth of information. I'm so glad I was able to sucker him to coming on <laughs> onto our show and sharing it with yes. us. Um, so for anybody who's interested, you know, you, you've got deals all the time. You're currently working on a deal. By the time somebody hears this podcast, it might not be the same deal. It might be another deal. Sure. Um, so if someone's interested in looking into the syndicated hotel model um, and they want to contact you to see what the opportunities are, what, um, what's the best way for them to reach you to learn more about it? Our website is pretty, pretty simple. It's just our name, but our name is uh, spelled fun. It's a Viva May. So V I V A M E E dot com. Viva May dot com. Okay. And that's the easiest way. Just go to that website and, uh, yep. and uh, okay. That's awesome. Thank yep. you so much, Josh. I really appreciate it. Any, uh, any last words for our guests? No, I just to thank you guys. And by the way, stay strong, everybody, and get over your fear. Uh, there's, there's a way for us all to be part of this real estate endeavor, as Ryan always says. So I'm really get, happy to be part of this, man. Get off the sidelines. It's time to, time to, time to uh, make some moves, make some money moves, as, uh, as what's that popular artist says now. I don't know. My kids listen to her. Anyways, <laughs> thank you for coming on the show, man. I appreciate it. Thank you, Ryan. Have a great day.